disease in base. For, for the last two years, Wade has, two years, Wade has been in private practice in Chanel Family Therapy. And and little, 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 there's, there's an echo somewhere. There's an echo somewhere. There he sees families and couples as well as children who are struggling with school related problems. Wade utilizes his experience from working in his to help families work with their school related problems. When therapy services are not available, in addition to seeing clients, Wade directs clients to Wade family therapy and supports the ongoing development of the private practice model. Uh, Wade is married, has two daughters, and is currently residing in Northern Little Rock, Arkansas. Please welcome Dr. Wade Fuquay. Thank you, everyone. Um, good morning to, or good, I guess, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are, it's morning here in, in Arkansas. Um, and I was excited to hear there's another Arkansan online with us this morning. I was, that was a nice surprise. So the, I would like to first note that the, this research was completed um, as a part of my dissertation process through uh, University of Louisiana at Monroe. Um, my, my chair wanted me to make sure that I uh, communicated that to you. So I'll go into a little bit of background and say, you know, as I graduated from a master's program, I ended up in school-based practice having absolutely no idea what that was. I, you know, all along went to school thinking I would work with adults in private practice and, and here I was working with kids and families and was clueless as how schools worked. So what did it mean to, have, to be a school-based therapist? What I began to notice is that the role of the school counselor where I was practicing was very different than the role of the school counselor that I remembered from when I was in school. And part of that, of course, is being on the student side versus being on the, on the staff side. But additionally, I, there were the school counselors in, in our, the district where I was working were going into the classroom less and less and we're spending more and more time on administrative functions and, and testing functions and, and whatnot. What was interesting though is that all of most of my referrals came from the school counselor and that they were getting referred all of these challenges related to behavior, mental and emotional um, health problems. However, they didn't have time to deal with it and so therefore there were in the district that I was working tons of outside clinicians working in the school. I also, kind of another layer is that, as we talked about on Friday, I, Arkansas does not have school certification for MFTs. So many of my peers were working in outside agencies. In fact, pretty much all of them were working in outside agencies con contracting with the school. And so it, was, it, was, it could be a little chaotic at times, certainly. And, and as, as he read my, my experience, changed a little bit over time to where at sometimes I was working with up to about 60 students and so fewer families, but it's a massive caseload across 10 plus school campuses, which is hard to keep up with. And gradually it transitioned to being embedded in, in one school and, and, you know, being almost considered staff. And, and that was a very different experience over time. So as I was beginning my dissertation process, I, I, you know, I thought, what's, what's meaningful for me? What's going to be captivating enough to, to get me through that process? As we all know, it's uh, awful. And so uh, it, was, it really became, for me, something it had to be related to schools. So I, I very early on found some survey research by Venom and Venom. And, and it was, a, it was a, a wonderful study that outlined just some positive and negative aspects of MFTs working in schools. I immediately connected with this. It was that, you know, as a systemically trained marriage and family therapist, that working in a school, you get to intervene in the context of the school related problem, right? You can see it happen and you're there and you can see the interactions and relationships and that's wonderful you get to work with all of the parts of the system, the teacher, the administrator, the other students, you know, with appropriate releases or classroom level intervention, 
with the janitors and the secretaries that they spend time with when they're in trouble. I mean, there's such rich information there. And then of course, that all means that there's a ton of support available for you to collaborate with and work with, as well as I was practicing primarily in an elementary school. And so as a neighborhood school, there was such a great proximity to families that it was less challenging to um, schedule family sessions, right? We could hop in the car and go visit the house or go bring them to the school. So there was a lot of availability there. There were, however, some negative aspects that this uh, research identified and that I connected with as well, in that sometimes we had shorter sessions. You know, we didn't have these hour long, 50 minute sessions that you tend to think of when uh, in therapy. And that at times there was a pep rally and that meant my session was canceled or it meant that there was a fire drill and we had to go outside. So there were also some challenges there that we don't typically think of in, in office based practice. And as, as many of you may know, like confidentiality in a school is so challenging. You know, I, I feel like the clients that I worked with, the janitor all the way to the principal knew exactly what was going on in that student's life. And while that's certainly valuable in some ways, because you can again have that um, support throughout the system, it is challenging to maintain confidentiality, especially when we're dealing with family problems that have a ton of shame associated with them and that the families that may be very private. So that was a challenge. And then of course, prioritizing academic interventions. You know, for some teachers or school staff, it may be important for that student to be in the classroom way more than they are in session. For other students, you may hear that the teacher values them to be in your sessions as opposed to being able to engage in a lesson in the classroom. So that, that does relate in somewhat to scheduling conflicts, of course, planning around core curriculum, but the, a ton of considerations that we haven't really had to think about when we're thinking of just traditional marriage and family therapy practice. So the next piece then was why MFTs? Why do I think MFTs are such a good fit? And, and for me, it started very basic with the cybernetic principles of marriage and family therapy, of, of therapy of mutual influence, um, examining relationships and context. This anti-individual and isolation approach paired with the non-pathological approach, which I think is very um, helpful in a classroom setting or in a school setting, um, again, lack of confidentiality, I think that that fits really well. And so for me, it was just this natural fit and, and we'll, we'll see more of that later on in, in the research. But then, so applying that to the classroom, can we count the number of interactions that happen among the students and the teachers in a classroom? I mean, it's, I can't think about it. it there's so many interactions there if you were just a fly on the wall, if you consider the day. And that's in an elementary classroom. What about in high school or middle school where they're changing classrooms day, you know, multiple times a day? That just is, there's this exponential number of interactions. And as a marriage and family therapist, that is, that is what we look at, that those interactions, that's hugely helpful. So as I was continuing on doing research, you know, realizing that while there is certainly a growing field of MFTs in schools and, and for example, working with what works, you know, solution focused practice in schools, but there is a significant chunk of school based therapists that use individual therapy models. So it may be more simplistic to look at that individual in isolation um, and their actions, behavior, consequence type approach. There's nothing wrong with that. I value that. And sometimes you have to speak that language. But it does ignore, I think, the, the changes that people make in response to their environment. Very simply, what happens when a, a teacher is out and there's a substitute? There is almost certainly going to be a change in that classroom climate that can relate to behavioral changes, um, you know, emotional outbursts and whatnot, that then when the teacher is back, it, it goes back to a, a very different dynamic. That to me is very systemic and just without even having to really think about it. So I asked myself what's missing. Um, you know, for me, I struggled to find how does the systemic training of MFTs influence therapy practice in a school setting? 
And then what difference do MFTs provide, you know, experience um, with school-based family counseling as related to, you know, a, more of a traditional school counseling approach? I think it's important to note that for me in, in the district that I was practicing in a very, you know, urban capital of our state of Arkansas, a district of 20,000 students, I was with the mental health coordinator in a conversation, the only identified MFT practicing in the district. We had tons of professional counselors, tons of social workers at various levels of certification, but, but no identified MFTs. And so it was very, that was also very isolating in some ways. There was no chance for collaboration. And, and I think definitely influenced the, the research. Because of that, I did choose to do an interpretive phenomenological study because for me, it was very much, you know, I, I'm making sense of this. There's a huge research or reflexivity piece involved. And so it, it for me, it was um, important to incorporate that into, into the research. So who did I interview and, and what were the criteria? Um, so I was interviewing licensed marriage and family therapists who graduated from CoMFTE accredited schools. That's important to note, I think, because there we had a discussion of how do you measure someone's systemic um, affiliation, their epistemology. And so the accreditation level of a training program seemed to be the best way to kind of standardize the systemic orientation that people may receive. They, um, it could be a provisional licensed MFT, not actually a fully LMFT. So that was important as well as many people working in schools are working on supervision hours and whatnot. Additionally, they, the participants either need to be currently practicing in school or within the last five years, just for you know, being able to have recent you know, recollection of events. Originally, I, I contacted the program directors of uh, these graduate programs and, and got some response, relatively minimal response, and I, I certainly understand why. And so, through after doing a few interviews, I found the WMFT Family Therapists in School TIN network and posted on the discussion board there and received a few more, um, you know, participants, which was wonderful. And then through some chain sampling, was able to eventually end up with a total of, of eight participants. Phone interviews, of course, I had people all the way from California up to New Hampshire, from Arizona. I, you know. Or, or, quite a diverse, I think, um, set of participants with phone interviews, um, 12 questions with some unique follow-ups. And then some did obviously participate in a member checking process following up. So through the analysis, this, these are the themes and where I wanna spend most of my time this morning, um, going through kind of explaining, explaining what happened which the first thing that became very obvious very early on was that school is a naturally systemic environment. The second thing that was very interesting was this, this bifurcation of experiences. So of engaging in the entire school system, not necessarily a district, so don't, I don't want you to think school district because some are very large obviously, but that in the school system within a, a campus versus going in and treating your identified clients and families and leaving. So there's less incorporation and engagement there. The third theme that, that emerged was this intentional involvement of family. Again, not a huge shocker as an LMFT that we would do that. And the fourth question, the fourth theme came from questions related to, you know, how do we increase our efforts for MFTs in schools? And it was that advoca advocating for MFTs in schools starts in the school. And I'll, I'll go into all of these a little bit more. So with the school being a naturally systemic environment, again, kind of going back to uh, things I mentioned before of seeing the change in a classroom from a teacher to a substitute from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year, that change over time. I, I heard people say things like, you know, the, the biggest thing to understand is that the school is a system. There, this is not isolation. There's not individuals here. Um, it's its own ecosystem. So a lot of these comments were coming up that really just spoke to this theme that students don't operate in isolation. Their behaviors um, in the classroom, that, which is usually what the teacher kind of identifies as a complaint, they have more layers. They have layers within the classroom. They have layers with outside of the classroom, outside of the building. 
And so those layers really spoke to that systemic level of um, thinking. That there are layers to the system, again, that schools have counselors, administrators, and teachers at the school level, and they have supervisors of those at the district level, and we know that sometimes those get involved in the school in particular cases. And so beyond the district level, there's also community referrals. In some schools, obviously, there's you know, nonprofits or other organizations working inside the school, sending readers into the school, um, tutors and whatnot. And so that there's just so many layers there that people are, were identifying through their experiences that spoke to the incorporation of them as, as being incredibly systemic from their perspective. The piece that I really loved was, and, and I, this resonated with me through, you know, experience with conscious discipline and, and whatnot, is the school family, that the school is a family, the classroom is a family. And so there's really this isomorphic relationship between how family members influence one another and then how MFTs can be able, can influence a school. If you can use that systemic brain, this is someone's quote, and view your school as a family and view those relationships that you build with every single teacher so that, that you emerge yourself into the school very much from a second order cybernetic perspective where you are a part of that system. What was interesting is that the, one of the participants reported that, that a lot of teachers already functioned like this, but that the language that they used was very different than the language that we use as systemic clinicians. And so we'll see this later on in the, in the kind of the advocating theme of, of language is important, but that, that it's already there. And so many times when people were reporting their experiences, they would go into the classroom and try to explain, you know, relationship-based um, treatment to these, to these teachers, the, the teachers could easily get on board with the concepts that were being explained, but it was important to explain them from a non-systemic language type perspective so that it was much more palatable to them. For me, this was probably the, the, the most powerful uh, theme that, that came through is that as, as, I, as, as I was reviewing transcripts, that the, these really lumped into two separate experiences. So I'll go through the first one, which is this engaging in the school system, the entire school, that this, this quote came up several times in, in different variations of the administrators literally treated me as if I'm another administrator. And by that they meant, that it wasn't just that their job was to see students, it was that they were, because of their perspective and relationships and, and the different ways in which that was applied throughout a school, able to be considered essentially an administrator, even though they weren't employed by the district, that could support discussions related to school climate, um, classroom management techniques and trainings. And so that was really different than the other experiences that we talked about in a little bit with, that we'll talk about in a little bit with the going in and, and treating your identified client. These MFTs had an increased ability to engage the school staff with, with these trainings again. So some, for some they identified trauma trainings, various family engagement, parenting trainings. One focused on restorative justice trainings, which I thought was really powerful. And so there was this ability to, again, not just provide this, um, you know, billable treatment service to identify clients, but to provide almost tier one across the school intervention. And with that, um, you know, the school staff, teachers, administrators began to consider these MFTs as experts in behavior and mental health and family and to influence policy and school planning. So whether that was school events of how do we include family or dealing with high conflict situations, which we'll see in a minute of, you know, we need to consider, you know, we need to, to talk to this person about how we should deal with this best. Um, you know, we have to follow the handbook in this regard. It's gonna make the parents mad. How can we support that relationship so that we don't alienate them? That was a really valuable role 
that some of these people be uh, reported being able to to fill, even though it wasn't actually focused on treatment, 100% direct direct focus. There was a little give and take too that these MFTs reported, which was they had to be flexible. You know, they had to be mindful of the limitations of the academic environment. There are some from a, from a from an MFTs or a, a school-based family clini clinician where you don't necessarily have the educational background and the focus that there are limitations to to what we can do, and sometimes the school has to follow the handbook. And sometimes, as MFTs, we do not want that because there's a very harsh, you know, um, punishment that goes along with that that we see a lot of implications. But that that's what the school has to do. So these MFTs reported really it was important for them to be flexible, which in turn meant that they could really engage more in other ways. And so there was just this, this systemic relationship between the MFT and the, the administrator or the school kind of administration that was able to, to build things. It really reminded me a lot of in, in therapy, you know, when a client has resistance, we roll with resistance. We're not going to necessarily be hugely confrontational all of the time and that we use that to help figure out what we're doing. So we use it. And I thought that was really interesting um, and helps understand better why these MFTs engaged a little bit more in the entire school as opposed to direct, direct care. So the other side of things was this focus on treating individualized clients. And it, you know, some identify it's a narrow line to where I offer to talk to people, to share some suggestions, and by people they, they were referring to teachers and school staff, but I don't tell them what to do. Now, I think that in some ways is indicative of we're a guest in their school, no matter how incorporated we may be, but um, this person's example was very much they're, they're, um, they had replaced a non-MFT as a clinician, and so their systemic interventions were not as welcome because they were not as used to it. So they felt like they could offer things, but it was when they said, you know, this is what we need to do, it was really off-putting. This was interesting, you know, from MFT, it kind of blows my mind that a lot of parents don't see the importance of working together. That I, this isn't a huge surprise, but still it's, Every time I read it, it is frustrating for me um, that, you know, sometimes parents viewed school related problems as school problems and they didn't want to be involved. I certainly experienced this in my practice. I imagine some of you have as well. And as a, as an MFT, right? So we need to, we know we need to work with a family. And so that was a very different experience that in these situations and perhaps it may be a cultural difference or a community difference that they you know did not view these school related problems as a place for family counseling so what did these kind of what were some characteristics you know one of the things that came up in these conversations was some employment related discussions for example an outside agency versus a school employee these individuals were outside agency individuals. They tended to have larger caseloads that were going into multiple schools. Not to say that those that had multiple schools couldn't be fully engaged because there were some examples of, of cases where you had multiple campuses that you had students on that you were considered a part of the administration and you were able to have that really full um, incorporated experience. These conversations tended to include more discussions of funding, uh, funding sources, particularly most of these were fee-for-service Medicaid discussions that was focused on having to meet a billing requirement. That seemed to be a bit of a barrier for these individuals for spending time doing some of these more school-wide interventions. Um, and then some school-specific um, restrictions based on they didn't have enough space or they didn't have enough time. Those were all limiting factors for these individuals that led to that, you know, indi treating individualized clients and not fully incorporating that systemic approach. Not a huge shock, right? The intentional involvement of family um, that MFTs, especially again, um, think, think um, kind of elementary school setting, neighborhood school or community school, 
you can easily move between home and school. You can be comfortable going, you know, home, doing home visits, going up to the school. You can be comfortable in, in multiple, all of those settings. Um, but that within looking at academic problems and looking at interventions for particular students and various, you know, academic meetings that MFTs, you know, use their skills to pick up on relational patterns contextual information and all of those things, even though they weren't treatment sessions and the clients may not have even been there, um, but that they could have been overlooked through academic only focuses. This, I think, is important because as a, as a, as a systemic clinician, we're very comfortable with multi, multidisciplinary meetings and conversations and incorporating different perspectives. And so, to be able to bring the relational perspective into some of these very intense academic um, special education type meetings, which sometimes we can forget about the family. And that was certainly uh, my experience working in a, um, you know, pretty much 100% free and reduced price lunch school, 51% Hispanic, and none of the teachers spoke Spanish. So there was a ton of limitations that you know, even though I also don't speak Spanish, I was able to say, you know, let's, let's think about the family. So how is family being involved though? And I think that for some, several people, it was family, school-wide family nights. Um, this one person was referring to it, it was a K-8 community school where they had family outings, they went skating and they had dinner, um, all family movie nights. And, and of course that's wonderful. But what that did was it gave that person the ability to see the family in multiple contexts, almost to gather communication samples that they could then use in treatment. And that it was all taking place in the context of the school. So the therapy, when it started with family counseling, that it not only um, supported the family with understanding the role of various school staff, Many of our families don't know what an IEP is, what a 504 plan is, but that parents are more willing to hear what the teacher has to say when counseling takes place in the school setting. It normalizes all of the school jargon and everything because you're already at the school, yet you're comfortable in the therapeutic alliance you have with your therapist. This was um, very interesting. I do a lot of co-parenting work in, in my private practice, and so that several MFTs, um, multiple identified that they would get called in for non-clients to help moderate and deal with high conflict parents. Again, our skills being multi-positional, almost from a Milan systemic perspective view, to be able to, to validate all of these different perspectives was very helpful in dealing with some of these high conflict situations. Um, and this is definitely something that I think is hugely valuable and really speaks to being able to incorporate over the whole school environment. And then the, the adv advocating piece that it starts in the school. Several people identified and, you know, sure, we absolutely have to have qual quantitative data. We, of course we do. Numbers make me a little nauseous, so I enjoy the experiential piece, but um, we have to have that. And that several of the individuals I, I'm work I, I worked with said that they, they're, as a part of the grant they were working under, gathered tons of data, but they weren't really doing anything with it. So, you know, we may have that, of course, to be able to, to meet funding source needs, but that we have to do something with that ultimately. The pieces that I was experienced, that I really um, was curious about was, yeah, but what, what do we do right now type discussions, which is the best way to, to start is to become a part of the system. The best way to do it is to share your experiences of working in a school, sharing that connection, um, which, I, is, which is one thing I think that we're doing as a part of our WMFT network, but that's an aside. Um, what was interesting was some people, a couple people said, the, the our title doesn't make sense. Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist, does that fit in the school? You know, the school may not initially think, let's hire or work with a marriage and family therapist just because they hear marriage first, and that doesn't necessarily fit what we naturally think of as a school setting. They thought more of a school social worker or a school counselor. So no, I don't think we need to change our title from licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, but 
we need to clarify the MFT skill set with the school. Again, this work, this is on the individual levels, individual level as well as well as the you know much larger uh, professional level of training our schools. If I'm an MFT going in, this is what I do. This is what makes me a little bit different. Whether that be through examples that they see over time with cases or just kind of a almost an interview process of this is what my skill set is. And that can help advocate for the inclusion of the MFT and that systemic thinking in these multidisciplinary meetings that are already a part of school. Again, it's already there. We're not having to really reinvent the wheel. We have to have a conversation, I think, that says, hey, this is what I do. I think this can be valuable for you. Give me a chance. And, and I think it will be valuable for you. I loved one of the persons who was in participants who she was she'd had some frustrating experiences and she said you know what I think we just really wanted someone needs to win the lottery get a lobbyist go around and you know be advocating for MFTs in schools you know not ideal but um, I think maybe if, if Kathy wins the lottery she might she might pitch in for a, a lobbyist I don't know so what did this do? And, you know, I, I saw a lot of the same uh, positive and positive and negative aspects that I talked about earlier in the presentation. So seeing those again was very helpful, kind of reifying those experiences. There was a just a good collaboration, a goodness of fit with MFTs in schools, much like medical family therapy or, or uh, MFTs in the military, where there, and there has been this larger incorporation in these what we think of as can be naturally systemic environments medicine tends to be multidisciplinary in a lot of ways and so mfts fit really well there again going back to that that bifurcation of experiences that to me was particularly um, important kind of to look at next steps because you very easily can see how you can have an mft in this neighborhood and mft in this neighborhood school and they have completely different experiences. And, and we need to understand both of those a little bit more in order to better advocate. So um, that, you know, whether it be looking at, are there confrontations between school staff and MFTs? How do we deal with that? To what extent do, do funding sources play a role in this? Um, and then also several of the people were previous teachers. I think that's particularly important um, that is te previous teaching experience and influence and being able to be fully incorporated into a school. You have the language, you have the terminology, all of that down. Does that make a difference? My guess is it, it absolutely does, um, but I definitely think that there's, there's, we need to do more there. So what, what, are we, what are we doing with this? Um, one of the pieces is, as my role in our TIN with WMFT, it's really important for me that we have practical resources for our MFTs in schools. Uh, one of the examples is early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, we had a webinar that was just about how are we transitioning family counseling to online? This was before we had a, a Zoom training about it, but it was just to get people together to collaborate. Again, sharing experiences, kind of the networking piece that we learned about yesterday from Michael Kelly. You know, that, that, that mindset is very, very helpful. Um, creating these groups to connect. There was one particular pocket of MFTs where they had um, peer support groups, right? They worked together to collaborate with school problems and how do they, and what happened in that community was that they said that after a few years, the school only wanted to hire MFTs and it's because they saw the influence of being able to work at a variety of levels throughout the school. And particularly for me, the next steps, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is, you know, how can I transition this? I'm no longer in an agency setting. I work in a private practice now. So to what extent do, the, do these experiences that I identify through this, these themes, how can they transition into a, a model of of school-based family counseling in private practice. Um, I have a, a few clinicians in our state that we're working with in our group practice that have started to do this. And there's a lot of the same discussions going on of funding sources and all of these different things that we don't particularly think of as, you know, um, systemic therapy related discussion, but are hugely important. 
And so I think that's a very important next step to, um, or these are several important next steps to, to what I've done here. Um, so that is what I had prepared for you today. Thank you. And we can't hear you. Mute. Forgot to unmute myself there. <laughs> it's early here in Alaska. Um, as I was saying, um, you touched on many, many of the challenges that the variety of uh, mental health providers trying to work in schools face from dealing with um, limited funding and principals and superintendents saying, you know, I've got this small pot of money. What's the best way I can use it? Um, another challenge uh, you alluded to, and I've dealt with this personally with superintendents who would say to me, you know, the role and function of schools is to educate. It's an academic environment and we are not a social service agency. Um, I was wondering, if you had a superintendent who said something like that to you, how might you counter that and talk about just the importance of, you know, if the child has uh, spent the night in the closet because of family problems, um, they're not really going to be ready to do math and reading and, and uh, all the other academic subjects. So I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Um, and, and I don't know that I can speak from the participants, but I'll say, for, for me and my personal experience, the school I was working at where I was, I was at for a, a long period of time. And what was interesting is they actually reconstituted the school staff while I was there. I was one of the few that was able to remain. And so it was actually kind of a great benefit because I had all of this relational knowledge of classrooms. And so I remember the first day of school, they were like, what students do we not need to put in the same class together? Because they had no idea. But again, in relationships, that's where my focus was. But I think my response is, how many, how many weeks do we send home food bags? How many, how many times do we put clothes on these students' backs when they come in? How many times have we given a bath to these students through the, through the nurse's office? How much medication do we administer at school? How many times does our home to school advisor take a student to the doctor? That makes school a social service, in my opinion. And so to say that it's not a multidisciplinary setting, you know, to me is very frustrating. And again, it's that you have to be flexible. I can't say that the academic piece isn't important. Obviously it is. But I worked with many students and some of you probably have too, where we fed them, we clothed them, sometimes they bathed them and we took them to the doctor. So, to say that the academic piece is the only function really is, it's kind of like you're, you're missing what's happening right underneath you. Um, but you have to do that respectfully, of course. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the participants. Do you have questions for Wade? I have, I have a comment, um, of course, Wade. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, it's really, uh, you have uh, brought up something that we don't talk about much at Oxford because this group is a love fest of people who are all systemic thinkers um, and we take different aspects of it, but we start with a base that's similar. What you have raised is the issue of um, really cultural assimilation of behavioral health care into education. And I'm sure we have talked in each one of our professions. Um, in, in the United States, there are six licensed mental health groups. And one of the issues, particularly the newer licensed groups like counseling and family therapists, have had a lot of um, challenges uh, becoming understood, becoming uh, joined. Um, I remember back in 1971, I was the very first school social worker in a town in Waterford, Connecticut. Um, and it was a Rorschach experience going to these eight different schools and having eight different series of expectations. There is also a lot of competition 
Um, and we, this is what I really thank you for bringing up because we, um, we have our own kind of um, uh, cultural bias, really, um, and implicit bias in each of our mental health groups uh, that I think in many ways have, have really prohibited us from being able to work together collectively in schools to really advocate for kids. And, um, and because this is such a collaborative group, we haven't talked about it much, but um, I'd like to and ask your thoughts about how do you see us building relationships with allied mental health groups in schools? It's a really good question. I, I, I think that um, for me, so Arkansas is, is a, is a, has a very urban population and has a very rural population in, in my experience. And so the people I supervised were in a, a rural part of the state um, where there were, there were no MFTs and there were very few clinicians overall. So part of it, I think, is having a diverse set of folks going into the district, right? That um, whatever is predominant there is, is going to be the prevailing view. So you can imagine in, a, in, in where I was working, there, there were very few systemic thinkers, because I know that you can certainly have that perspective and not be an LMF and an LMFT, mm -hmm. um, but that there was just no, there was no conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And so kind of going back to, like I said, having these networks, creating conversations around it, um, you know, I was thrilled to see that there was another MFT from Arkansas on here, which kind of blew me away. So having just those connections, it's a, sl it's a slow burn, but mm -hmm. I think it's an important process. Um, for this, I, I love the way you put it, that reframe of cultural assimilation of behavioral health care in schools um, is, is really important. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a related question. On the one hand, you talk, uh, Kathy asked about transitioning between the different theoretical perspectives and the different uh, MFT disciplines that are happening within your country, the USA. But how do you see taking the the the, uh, the knowledge that you gained to um, across the uh, across the boundaries of countries to other countries where there is a great need, but where MFT is not yet an established um, idea, where school-based family counselling is even difficult to to pursue, and where in a sense. The majority world is mm -hmm. because uh, if you take the world as a whole america is a small part of mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. it might be a big country with lots of people yeah. but if it's a small part of the world and sure. um, having worked in in asia and yeah. now in south africa i just see such a big 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 oh, need into different cultural contexts different countries uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I appreciate you bringing that out. Like this, this is very, um, this, this experience is, I think, very American. Yes, I agree with that. Very aligned with, you know, kind of a, a U.S. model of education. I think that, again, going back to, for me, I, I, I looked at LMFTs, and I know that that is very limiting when you look outside of, of areas where MFTs are not as established. So looking at something that's much more based on systemic thinking, I think is important. Um, but again, the, the, our, our kids spend how much time at school a day and therefore how much time at home. And I spend a ton of time at school. And so being able to incorporate that is, is just, it's really important for me. I do think that something like this should happen. And, you know, as far as looking at these experiences in pockets around the, the, the world that have a very different educational structure. Um, you know, I certainly don't have experience in those educational structures, but I think that looking at the experiences is very important because that's how we build connection and, and build networking through understanding experiences, not necessarily as through as much the data on the paper. You know, for me, that's valuable information, but I want to know how can I connect with people? And so that's, that's I think that's for me the important piece. Um, with this. 
Could I say one other thing about that? And that um, it's borrowing from Michael Kelly um, that in the field of social work, that one of the other axioms is that you start where the client is. Mm -hmm. And what we've adapted for that in school-based family counseling is start where the client system is. So no matter what we're called and wherever we are, to know the systems that we're working in and then to think systemically about how to, how to um, create opportunities, join with other folks, that sort of thing. Uh, we, we will struggle with vocabulary forever um, and we will struggle with what we're called, but I think the thing that unites us all is systems thinking and it's out of application. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. I just have one comment about what Wade has said in terms of uh, being visible and being at the school site. We're just looking at the way my district worked, um, it, starting with speech therapists, they started out being contracted. And when the district realized that there is more need for it, they became part of the staff and was hired uh, or was into the, um, the school system. So I think with MFT, uh, people, you can be in contract, but then as the need gets greater, you will be incorporated into um, the system as, as um, people understand more about what you do. And that family component, I feel, is so important that um, people have not paid enough attention attention to and mm -hmm. not have time for. And I think, uh, you know, MFT counselors do fill that gap in the school setting. And not many people see it that way, but as you bring in your presence and make it available that you do work with families, that there's gonna be more and more need for it. And then you will be part of the staff as you educate people and be present. So um, that's just been my experience, even just starting with speech therapists. So you're, you're on your way there. Sure. You know, just to pick up on the last, maybe depressing part of the um, problem is the financial aspect. And that's why evidence-based research is going to be so key to finding out how MFT's value is in the schools as it pertains to their budget. And um, that's the hard part because we're not trained to basically as LMFTs and, you know, unless we're in a research oriented mind mindset to gather that information, uh, the bottom line is how do we put out the value of LMFTs in a school setting, especially public school setting, because in New York City, uh, they are not in the school system. They're in private schools because they see the value there. But in this setting, the setting, David Hamilton in New York said, um, we already have that established when I went to lobby to get MFTs in New York. He said, well, that's a little bit complicated because we already have school psychologists and social workers in the school, so we don't need you. So mm -hmm. still fighting that battle, but thanks to Kathy's work in Connecticut, it'll spill over, I hope. Mm -hmm. But that's the mindset. If we had more grants for LMFTs to prove our worth and to spend money for evidence-based research, we'd be in better shape. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, well, thank made for your good work. I could just take Jackie's comment a step further and thinking a little bit. I really appreciate your presentation, Wade, especially being, you know, new to Arkansas. I've been there for a little over a year and understanding sort of the landscape in, in terms of resource deserts um, in, in Arkansas, but thinking about how to support MFTs just in doing the work, because as a former school-based therapist, I think you mentioned some school-based therapists having like 60 clients and I could not imagine having anywhere near that caseload. I, we used to cap it at about 25 and we were also responsible for Medicaid billing. Um, documentation standards through Medicaid were a challenge and so doing all of that and having to attend to that large of a caseload I can imagine might run some MFTs away from the school setting. So um, I wonder if, if you find in your research, you're having conversations with folks about the, the mandates and requirements, um, the burden of some of those requirements and ways to offset some of those burdens so that they can continue to increase their presence in schools. Absolutely. I think that there were several people and, and I've just since then had conversations with people that, you know, the requirements of billing and documentation and all of these types of things um, meant that really all they had time for was just to see the student 
because that's what the school valued. So they didn't have time to, to, to invite the family, go get the family, you know, cause that, that takes non-billable time. And again, so, so those conversations where it was this, you go and see your clients and leave experience that had a lot more content related to billing, um, insurance and whatnot, and just employment, employer, you know, requirements. That's huge. Um, and it's also, not something that we're trained to do very very much as mfts in in the states at least we don't i don't think that we get a ton of training in my opinion of this is how you do all of your notation and this is how you write all of your treatment plans and manage all of your you know that we spend a lot of time on 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 practice which is wonderful that's why i love practice i'm not a huge numbers person but um there's a lot of limitations there and it became um, challenging to even as a supervisor to have those conversations of now I have to enforce the employment and the, the billing and documentation standards but I totally value like that gets in the way of your practice so yeah I don't know that I have a solid answer other than be there with them in the moment and validate that's a incredibly difficult experience um, you know how can we make it work for you Any other questions for Wade? All right. Well, Wade, uh, thank you very much. It's been very informative, very interesting. And uh, we can do our thank you. We have Christine Tippett. Yes. Christine? Okay, thank you. And Wade, I would like to thank you very much for doing your research on school-based mental health. And that's what I would like to have everybody call it because then whether it's provided by LMFTs or LCSWs, then it would not be confusing to the people who are already school counselors, who when people come on to the schools and are doing the mental health counseling, the school counselors are not afraid that their jobs are gonna be usurped because they're gonna be doing some of the counseling, but they're doing the academically oriented counseling. And the school psychologists are doing the psychology as assessments that are preparing them for whether they're gonna get 504s or IEPs. We're not taking that away. We are doing the therapy that's doing the self-esteem, the whether they're gonna get kicked out of school, their academic performance, their behavior management, and all the stuff that gets in the way of them keeping their grades up. We can do research on that and all that. We can bring the families to school, which the schools weren't used to. And you even did research on that and that was wonderful. But it's just called school-based mental health. And we can do it for free if you guys make contracts with your schools so that they can get their internship hours. So you talked about that really well and did that with the people that you got in contact with. So that was wonderful. And you even talked about the risks and benefits, which had to do with confidentiality, working with the administrators, the staff, the teachers, the families, which are all a part of not only the system, but the families that exist as part of the school family. And that was wonderful. But with that, the kids can either be engaged or disengaged. And that is what makes the kids either have whole child success or failure. That can be done at schools for free, except for what the schools pay you to do the supervision or the agency to do the service, or they can do it in a different format. If they do it fee-based, but then it's more expensive. But you described it really well, so congratulations on getting your doctorate. Thank you. explained you. it really, really well. And I'm so happy to know that it's happening all over the United States, but especially in Arkansas. And so it was wonderful to hear about it. Good job, Wade. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause for Wade? <laughs>